meeting. Also, happy Father's Day. And in case you're wondering, there are some free eggs and tomato plants out in the entryway if anybody's interested in those. And also today is Father's Day and being Father's Day. Remember on Mother's Day, everybody got a baby bottle to fill up and bring back. Well, today's the day you're supposed to bring them back and I see that the basket back there has got quite a few in there. So to encourage you to do that. And all that money goes to Northern Options to help uh, with their endeavor to save baby lives. Wednesday at 6.30 is the adult Bible study. We're continuing the Truth Project, and this week we'll be looking at the DVD in regard to science and what the Bible has to say about science and what that has to do with the Truth Project. Also at 7.30 is Lyft for our young people, so teenagers keep that in mind as well. And I just see that we have a sheet to pass around, and I will get that started for you. Okay, this time we have a, a, a gift of baked goods uh, for our fathers and stuff that are that are here, or if you're uh, going to see your father shortly this afternoon, I'm sure there's plenty to go around. But um, let's have uh, let's have kids. Let's do what do we do on Mother's Day? Malachi, did you have to do it on Mother's Day? Actually, all the kids just kind of pitched in and helped on Mother's Day. Why don't we just do that again? If you're a kid here and you got a father here, grandfather here, come on up to uh, take them a prize. And in fact, we'll just have all the younger kids, everybody from, let's say, below fifth grade, come on up and help uh, hand out goodies to all the fathers in the room. Now we're watching you to make sure you get it to them. <laughs> I heard Titus got up here and was like, oh. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> huh? I don't know why. Tell you why? Just uh, take. I'll tell you what, anybody with a hand up, go give it to them. Men, if you, fathers, if you could raise your hand. Oh, you're giving it to me, Titus. I see what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right over the top. <laughs> here, Grandpa, I don't know why, but here you go. <laughs> Yep, there's, yeah, there's some upstairs. Head upstairs. Yep. <laughs> did, you, did you get one to him? Or not? Asher wrote. <laughs> yep, if you're a father and you haven't got one yet, if you could hold a hand up, you'd do these kids a big favor. <laughs> Up in front, Lambert didn't get one. Is that what you're saying, Craig? I can't have one. Oh, that's right. He's diabetic. Okay. You guys got the job done? All right. One more. Mally, run one back there. Last row on the left. <laughs> okay, I think we got her covered. Maybe. If not, they're right here. What? Yeah, he, he better have. He was pointing at Lambert. You got one, didn't you, Holmes? Yeah? Okay. 
All right. Well, happy Father's Day. Now, let's, uh, let's take a few moments and, and uh, anything you got, a, a memory or something that stands out. It could be something that happened in the past or some r- recent past is uh, this morning, if you'd like. But uh, uh, something that happened or something you appreciate about your dad, um, anything that would honor your father, now is your moment. But not everybody at once. <laughs> Darlene. Good, Kathy. Well, I often share about my dad, but I want to share about my husband, which he's not my dad, but he's my children's dad. That's right. And uh, he was blessed with a card from our eldest son that talked about his character and his, um, what's the word? It's the thing I always think of when I think of my husband, which is they do what they say, integrity. Hmm. I can, I can remember a time, in fact, that's one of the things I was thinking about a little bit ago about my dad, that there was time in my life, later teenage years, where we were butting heads a lot, and um, I was trying to go my own way, which was not a good way, and he was trying to rein me in, and, you know, years later, um, years later, once we got moved up here and everything, I mean, my life straightened out a long time before that, but you would hope or I'd never, you'd never call me as your pastor, <laughs> but, 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 uh, but years later, we'd take our teenagers down to the cities for a week and we would, um, go to a place called gospel Hill where they would take kids from the inner cities and from the homeless shelters. And they would bust them up to this camp every day from, and they would be at this camp from like nine to three every day. And we would work with the kids from the inner cities and you got a glimpse our teenagers would get a glimpse of their lives in doing that and um, there were a lot of things that they got to participate in but that was one of the things that always stood out to our kids they were like wow they would go home so appreciative of their home and their families and their their life that they had and and I remember even as the adult and leader in that it, it, it really impacted me I remember thinking for all the times where I was so button heads with my dad over trying to go my own way I was so thankful that he was always there to butt heads with because that's what kept you going a better direction. That's what was, that was your rescue, right, from yourself. And I just remember thinking after spending days with these kids, thinking, man, those kids do not have the same shot that I had at life. And you know what? It was mainly because of my family. It was mainly because, like what Kathy said, I had a dad that didn't mind being the bad guy. If uh, I needed a bad guy to bump into to make me not go a certain way, he was right there in my path. And uh, I'm very much, a, very much appreciative of that as, as well, for sure. Mom's not so good at that part. Dad's, it's a challenge. <laughs> not, not really, but it's important. Yes? Oh. <laughs> 
That's good. <laughs> yes, Amber. Greg, I just want to say I'm thankful and appreciative to all the stepfathers and the men that walked into a blended family and put their mm. role as a father to some children that needed it. No doubt about that. No doubt. Carter. Johnny, sorry. <laughs> Awesome. Very cool. This is Johnny's last week of singleness. <laughs> and, and he can't wait for it to be over. <laughs> I know, I remember that. Yeah. Your dad is about to get even more wise, like... <laughs> and then when the kids come... And more wise. Yes. I'm thankful for Aaron, and you know, he's been a really good dad to my kids. And he's just really grown, honestly, since we've been here. And hmm. he's just having deep spiritual discussions with them, and it's really great. Very cool. Awesome. I'm just curious why we're not seeing tears from the fathers like we did on Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have to reboot the man card. <laughs> oh, Ariana. <laughs> yeah, it certainly does. Yeah. That's good. All right, Matt. That is so tempting. <laughs> oh, now that's the guy I was really looking forward to getting married. All these things that ail you gone by that time. All right. All right, Alec. For for Aaron here. Yeah. Right? That's cool. Awesome. Peanut? I'm thankful for all the funny projects that you do for us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little less thankful sometimes. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 
we definitely we did, recently drove down the down the road with a two-story playhouse straddling my trailer for, it was what she's talking about there mary Mm. And um, I looked up to him, and uh, he instilled in his sons that also. And um, Jim has been such a godly father to our children. And one of the comments that I always remember him saying as the kids were growing up, it was always like, the kids would say, well, what's wrong with that? And Jim mm. would say, well, tell me what's right with that. Right. And usually, you know, it was something that they wanted to do that we were saying, no, we don't think that's a good idea. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, that usually stopped the, you know, the conversation right then. And he said, well, right. you know, well, okay, they'll have an argument here again, so. Yeah, <laughs> guess there's, guess we haven't come up with any reasons to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's good. That's good. Yes, Janet. My dad was really quiet and he was a really good listener. And he was very humble. He was very talented and a really good cook and woodworker and stuff. And he always encouraged my brother and I to try new things and encourage us to do things. And I just appreciate that about him. And he encouraged us to do things. Mm. I remember hearing a story. Uh, Ted Weinberg, a lot of you know who he is. We used to support him as a missionary when he and Diane were in Africa and stuff a lot. And, and um, he had a mom like that. He was uh, raised in a home without a dad, but he had a mom that was always, oh, you can do it. You, no matter what it was, you can do it. You can, you can figure that out. You can accomplish that kind of a thing. And, and so one day he decided he was going to pay his mom back for all the support. So he was going to pour her a new driveway, nice concrete driveway. So he called the cement company and he ordered the truck and they came and they poured it out and he was really surprised when it didn't just like <laughs> go where it goes, you know, flatten out. And so the, the concrete truck driver looked at him and he's like, well, what are you going to do? And he's like, I don't know. So they ended up, <laughs> they ended up troweling a driveway, which I, uh, troweling loosely defined with empty tuna cans and stuff that they had on the house. Something metal to be able to flatten that concrete out and get it spread out and around there. So I remember it, that just cracked me up because his mom was obviously long on encouragement, short on know-how <laughs> on some things, I guess, or, or whatever. But yeah, that's awesome. Well, uh, our, our dads, when you think about it, we, we owe a great tribute, as, as we discussed with our moms on Mother's Day and our, our fathers on Father's Day. There's a there's a, there's a lot. When you, when you compile the things that we've talked about this morning as we strive to honor, honor our dads, there's, there's everything from that acceptance and, and, um, and love to that, uh, and all of it motivated by love, but also to the, those roadblocks and those uh, being the bad guy at times, and, and a lot goes into being a dad, and, and we desperately need that in our lives. So kudos to all the dads out there that are maintaining their post faithfully in the good times and the bad and even to the ones that are stepping outside their family and uh, bringing uh, new kids into their family or just being that within their neighborhood and the communities in which they live as well. Uh, so definitely a, a very God-honoring trait. All right, let's go ahead and uh, we're going to open the Word of God here this morning and we're going to continue our, our, our path through the book of James. As we continue our study of the book of James, we find ourselves in James chapter 2. <clears throat> so we're going to read James uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Beginning in verse 1, it says, uh, my brothers, just two words. Now there's, uh, <clears throat> if you look at the book of James, and I like the way that he does this, but we've already seen it in a couple different places, though we may not have pointed it out uh, up to this point. Like back in verse 2, it says, count it all joy, my brothers. And then uh, verse 9, he talks about the lowly brother boasting in his exaltation. Um, and 
uh, verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. He, he keeps referring to the people that he's writing to throughout the book, either as my brothers or my beloved brothers, a little extended form. Um, like in this short five chapters, he refers to them that way 15 times. He'll call them that. And so what that kind of does is he's about to go into some, some uh, issues on how we treat people and how we look at people. And he starts by kind of leading the way and looking at them as fellow brothers in Christ, fellow family members in the family of God. And so as we pick up there, he says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones, are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You know... I remember reading uh, years ago an, an, an account of a pastor that was in, uh, he was in a larger church, and um, to kind of teach this point or to illustrate it, he decided to uh, kind of pull, a, perform a test, I guess you'd call it, upon his congregation. And so on a Sunday morning, bright and early, he got up and, and he proceeded to uh, try to make himself look like a homeless person. Right? He dressed way down and I suppose grew stubble and whatever, whatever else he did. But he went to great lengths, apparently good enough lengths that not too many people recognized him or noticed him. And then he kind of hung around out in front of the church as people were coming to church and making their way in and coming in and sitting down. And, and so uh, it kind of unfolded in an interesting way. The people coming up the sidewalk into church are making their way past the guy and coming in and finding their seat. And... Um, but because he's out doing that, then he's not where he usually is. So after a while, people are kind of looking around. Well, where, where's the pastor? Where's, when's things going to get going? And he waited till he was a little bit late. And so the people are really kind of curious what's going on and, and kind of sitting there in their place and looking around and ready for worship. And then uh, the surprise when, from the, when, the, when the doors open and in comes this guy. And it looks well, like a homeless individual, and he comes shabbily dressed, and he starts walking up the aisle, and then they're curious what's going on, and then he ascends up onto the pulpit area and turns, and everybody recognizes who it is. And then he just talked about what the experience was that morning, how many people wouldn't make eye contact or look past him or walked around him or... And I'm sure he had people that greeted him and stuff as well. But uh, he had probably had to tell those people to be quiet and not blow his secret. But, but uh, he, he talked about what that was like and, and what was involved in doing that and, and how he was, and challenged them to question how they, were, how they perceived him and whether they felt that their response was a good response or a poor response and, and deal with this issue of partiality of kind of prejudging, kind of buttonholing somebody uh, already before you know who they are or what they're like or, or have a conversation or, uh, and exercise that partiality. Well, that's what the book of James is about. 
the book of James, he kind of fabricates a little story, doesn't have a, a specific person, and it doesn't say like Jesus often did, like there was this, guy, this beggar named Lazarus, and then Jesus tells a, a story which we know then is a, a true account. This one is one that he just kind of fabricates. He's going to fabricate a story and say, let's say two different people come into the church. And one of them's dressed this way, all nice and uh, gold rings on the fingers and that kind of thing. In fact, uh, literally what that term means is a gold finger. And probably what it's alluding to is in, in those days, um, if, if you could afford it, you would put multiple rings on your finger. And that's how they referred to it as the gold, the gold finger, because then the more rings you had, it showed that you had more wealth. And so, so it showed your, 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 you to be a wealthy person. It showed you to be a person, probably a position within society. And so you're an important person. The more rings you have on, the more important you are. Well, that's the terminology they use for you. So you've got this gold-fingered guy that comes in with all these rings showing off his wealth and standing in society. And then you have this guy that's poor, and he's dressed in rags. And he's just calling our attention to how do we... How do we treat people like that? Well, you know what? It's probably not just, it's not just in that kind of a thing, but even um, how do you treat people, like you, you've got people that are popular and people are less popular. Is there a difference in the way that we treat those two people? Or do we have the same kind of compassion and kindness for both of them? And that's really the situation that he's, that he's dealing with, is he's dealing with this problem with partiality. And you know what, I, I think it's often, um, I think sometimes we can be partial without even recognizing it. In fact, I think often people are partial without recognizing it. Uh, I think it's something that uh, people can often see in you better than you can see within yourself sometimes. But that's just even more reason for the self-examination I think also we don't, we don't see it as the, the evil that it is. You know, when you look through this passage, he identifies it as sin, as a transgression, as evil in our judgment. Um, so God's perspective of it is uh, that this is a sin that's worse than what we uh, often attribute to it, I think, uh, as, we, as we consider what our, our bad sins or horrible things to participate in in our life. And so, you know, those are good reasons that we ought to really think about this. This is kind of one of those, if you want to call it a white collar sin, I think, <laughs> that can kind of fly under the radar and we can be participating in it and involved in it and a red flag sometimes doesn't even go up over that. And so it's an area where Christians really need to pay attention and say, what is our heart toward other people? And do we cater to people that are have more... Uh, what should we call it, social clout, right? To, to people that have more popularity in that sense. You know, I think it kind of boils down to kind of a self-centeredness when you think about it. Because if we do give more credence or more attention to people that have that kind of clout, then wh why would we do that? It seems like it's, it has to be because there's something that we gain from that, right? And so it has to kind of boil down, I think, to that self-centeredness. But at any rate, the, what we're considering here this morning that James is pointing out to us is a problem of partiality. Now, he's already kind of been, he's already been hitting there. He's already dealt with it in a couple different ways in chapter 1. Chapter 1 in verses 9 through 11, he says, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. So he takes the one and he says, Look, if you find yourselves in poverty as a believer in Christ, don't worry. Don't worry about it. And rejoice in your exaltation. God reaches down into your life and he lifts you up. And he says, if you find yourself to be rich in, in your life, then rejoice in your humiliation. In other words, what were they to rejoice in exactly about their humiliation? Doesn't seem quite as uh, understandable as rejoicing in your exaltation. But it's the fact that your richness doesn't get, make you any more acceptable before God than the poor guy's poverty does. In fact, he goes on to say, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. 
the wealthy in the middle of their pursuits. So they continue to pursue wealth and accumulation and things like that and go on through life. Right in the midst of all that, at some point he's going to die and it all goes to somebody else. And so what is there, what, what exactly is he saying? He's saying plain and simply, as you've heard many times, at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. It's flat. Your poverty doesn't get you any closer to God, neither does your wealth get you any closer to God. The poor man can rejoice in the fact that in Christ he is going to be raised from the dead and he's going to be exalted before God. And the rich man can rejoice in the fact that that wealth doesn't buy him anything. It's not that cheap of a deal. But the precious blood of Christ, uh, the cross where the Christ died on, at the ground there, the footing is level. There's not an advantage one way or the other in that so you think about that then, from that theological understanding, then the natural consequences of that would be you treat everybody the same. You're not going to show preference to somebody because of their social status or the clothes that they wear or their uh, uh, standing within society. You're going to treat them just even because none of that stuff really matters anyway. He also goes, when he gets to the end of chapter 1, in verse 27, we saw last week that he said, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So he started talking about, or ended up talking about at the end of chapter 1, this pure religion. And he says, look, if you're going to exercise a pure religion before God, then the way that you treat people is going to be high on your list. In fact, he highlights two groups of people, the widows and the orphans, who both would be your more vulnerable within society, and says, look, if, if your religion is pure, if it's undefiled before God, then you're going to have some focus on how you treat people that are in disadvantaged positions within your society. They're in vulnerable positions. And so as we come up to this point, and that's the last verse before we hit James chapter 2. And what is the very first thing that he says in James chapter 2? Don't show partiality. He begins it that way. He says, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Later on in the passage, in verse 9, he says, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by law as a transgressor. And so he's saying, look, we need to make sure we don't show partiality. If we do, we're participating in sin that we need to repent of. He says, we need to, we need to be impartial in the way that we treat other people. Well, in Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 23, it emphasizes the same thing. It says, these also are sayings of the wise. Partiality in judging is not good. And so we're looking at this issue of partiality. You know, it, it's, notice what he says there. It's, we should not exercise partiality in holding on to our faith. What exactly does that mean? It means you, as you live out your life before God, you hold on to that faith. You're trusting in Christ as you live out your life. You know, it, it is a complete contradiction for us to treat or have partial partiality, exercise partiality toward people um, if we're trusting in Christ. Because when you look at the situation, he's saying, look, you can't treat the poor negatively and the rich positively. That would be the partiality that he's talking about. But when you think about Christ, who was he? Now, I know he's the son of God, which ranks him way up there, right? But who was he in this world as he came and was born into this world? He was born into just a poor carpenter's home. Nothing, not white collar, blue collar worker in that home. He was born into a poor home. We know it was a poor home because of the offering that they offered up when they dedicated Christ was the, what you were allowed to offer if you were poor, if you couldn't afford the regular offering for that dedication. And so he was brought into a home in, in poverty. He was raised in that home that was in poverty. And we'll focus a little bit more even on, on his experience in, in a few minutes. But as we look down through the passage, there's kind of three areas that he, or ways that he's going to deal with it. First is just the principle. He's going to lay out the principle of, of what exactly is he dealing with in this partiality. Then there's going to be a little bit of a test. There's a few words in there that kind of test us. Give us a test where we can examine ourselves and say, look, do I have a problem with this? Do I treat 
people partially or impartially. And there's a, a few words in there that can kind of test ourselves. And then in the end, there's the outcome, right? There's this outcome about um, where do I fall in this and what can I expect as I, as I see where I line up in this situation. So it's a very practical passage as all the book of James is. But as we see the, the principle, firstly, we want to focus on the fact that partiality is not consistent with faith. It's not consistent with faith. He, he just told us about how we're holding on to that faith in Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, and we should not do that in a way that exercises partiality. You know, Jesus, as I said, was born in a, a poor home, raised in a poor home. In fact, they ended up, um, they, he was born in Bethlehem, which Bethlehem, notable city, but nothing compared to the glory of Jerusalem. Right? Then they end up moving off to Egypt to protect him from Herod back to, his, back to Israel, but not back to Bethlehem or even to, or to Jerusalem. Where does he go? To Nazareth. And it says that he is raised in Nazareth. Now, Nazareth did not have the best of reputations. In fact, when Philip calls his brother Nathaniel and says, hey, we've found the Christ. Nathaniel, and he starts to tell him about Christ. Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip's answer to him, come and see. Come and take a look. You'll find. But that Jesus, so Jesus raised in a place that, that that was kind of the mindset of. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And so if, you're, if somebody was going to be partial about Christ, they would have to be kind of against him. Right? Not necessarily for him. It looks like leaning in this. Uh, Galilee had the same thing. As he comes out of Galilee, that, that was a lot of the speculation about him too. Is, well, no prophet comes from Galilee. In fact, in John chapter 7, verse 41, as they're discussing Christ and he's doing all these amazing miracles and some people are saying, look, this has got to be the guy. Right? If, when, the, when the real guy comes, if this isn't him, when the real guy comes, is he going to do more than this guy is doing? This has got to be the guy. And others are saying, no way, it's not the guy. And there's kind of discussion back and forth. It says, others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? And then a little bit later in the same chapter, in verse 52, it says they replied, are you from Galilee too? In other words, they're using it, the, the term Galilee in the region that they're from up there. Are you from there too? In other words, are you not that sharp? You're not the sharpest knife in the drawer either? Is what they're, what they're saying to him. He says, look, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So they're, they're, they're ruling out Christ. He can't be the guy because he's from Galilee. Surely he wouldn't come from Galilee. Just like Nathaniel did. Nobody would come. Nah, he wouldn't come from Nazareth. You know, when you look at Jesus' life, he was poor from start to finish. In economic and physical ways i'm amazed when i read through the gospels you realize just about everything that you find jesus using he borrows right he borrows a boat to stand out there and teach on or to travel across it he he borrows a boy's lunch to multiply it and feed everybody else he borrows he borrows a tomb because he's only gonna need it for three days but he borrows a tomb to be buried in just about everything, everything that you find him doing something that involves a possession. He borrows an upper room to have the Passover with his disciples. He borrows a donkey to go riding into Jerusalem on. Just about everything physical that he touches is borrowed. It's, it's kind of like, I remember when I moved here. I think I needed a ladder for something. Didn't have one with me. We packed kind of light coming up here. I needed a ladder. I mentioned to Dan Siltman, I gotta go buy a ladder, I need a ladder. He says, ladder ain't something you buy, it's something you borrow. <laughs> Small town living, I, I thought, this is cool. But you know what, Jesus, Jesus, I did buy a ladder by the way, but <clears throat> Jesus, he borrowed just about everything. He was he's in poverty. And then not only that, but his statements about his life mission. In Mark chapter 10 verse 45 says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. In Luke chapter 5 verses 31 and 32 it says, And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And Jesus was often ridiculed for hanging out with the publicans and the sinners. In other words, he wasn't spending his time looking for the chief seats among the Pharisees. 
He was more content reaching out to the people that they would look in disdain upon because he would not show partiality between the two. In fact, if he had a problem with anybody, it would be the Pharisees. And so it's completely, when you think about our faith, it would be completely inconsistent with our faith to show partiality to people that are wealthy or, or privileged in society and demean somebody else when our Savior himself came and lived in poverty situation, when he focused his ministry on reaching people that were struggling and suffering. Now, not that the gospel doesn't go to the rich. The gospel goes to the rich as well. But, but he made a real effort to focus on taking the poor to the people who need it. And when he was challenged on it, he said, look, it's not, the, it's not the sick, or it's not the well that need a doctor, it's the sick. And so he keeps going to them. And so it is inconsistent with our faith if we show partiality uh, over, from one person over another. But secondly, partiality is also inconsistent with love. Now, this is, this is big if you think about it, because how does, as we've pointed out many times, how does the Apostle Paul tend to evaluate churches, Christians? If you look through the Apostle Paul's epistles, through his letters, he tends to evaluate, and I know that we're studying the book of James right now, but the Apostle Paul, who is dominant in writing the New Testament, tended to evaluate people through faith, hope, and love, these three things. Remember in the book of 1 Corinthians, he said, now abide these three things, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Uh, you can find many places where the Apostle Paul in an epistle will say, uh, he'll commend them for uh, maybe one or two of these things and then go to work on the third one to help them, like Thessalonians is that way. He actually commends them for where they are in all three of those categories, but then he goes to work at helping them strengthen their hope because that's where they were struggling a little bit. Well, James in this, in this chapter, in this passage, he's going to take two of those things and challenge us with them. He's saying, look, it's inconsistent with your faith, the, your faith in the Lord of glory as you hold on to your faith and live your life. It's inconsistent then to uh, be, treat people partially one toward another. But then also, he says in verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. And we'll focus on that a little bit more later. But he brings in this concept of love. He says, look, if you're, if you're doing it right, if you're treating everybody like you would want to be treated, if you're loving your neighbor and you consider, that kind of becomes the rub, right? When, you, when Jesus challenged the religious leaders of Israel with that, their next question, well, well, well who's my neighbor? <laughs> okay, I'll love my neighbor, but I want to define who that is. And Jesus says, okay, I'll define it for you. And he starts to tell him about the guy that goes from Jerusalem to Jericho and he gets robbed on the way and left for dead. And he's in the ditch. And then you have the Levite comes by and passes, crosses the road so he doesn't have to deal with the guy. And the, and the priest comes by and passes, goes across the road. And then you've got this Samaritan. Now the Jews hated the Samaritans. They were dogs they referred to them as. And the Samaritan actually stops and helps the guy. And Jesus says, now let me ask you one thing. Out of those three people, which one was his neighbor? And so he doesn't mind taking this chance to identify who our neighbor is. Anybody that we can be helpful to, is that's, that's who our neighbor is. But when we look at this passage, it's, it's telling us, look, if, if you look in your life and you're doing that consistently, then you're doing well. If you're treating everybody as your neighbor and you're dealing them with the same amount of kindness and compassion, then you're doing well. But if you're not, then you're sinning. You know, the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, he defines it a little bit or explains it a little bit more clearly. He says, Oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Uh, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. You know, the Old Testament, we find way back, I think Le the book of Leviticus, I think is the first place that you find this command to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus highlighted it. He would be asked at one point, what is the greatest commandment? And he would say the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But he wouldn't stop there. He said the second 
is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, in this, the whole law is fulfilled. When you look at the Ten Commandments, they're broken down exactly like that. The first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. Have no other gods before me, no graven images, keep the Sabbath, uh, these things. The next, I'm not using the name, Lord, name of the Lord in vain, the next six commandments, the last six, have to do with our relationship with one another, honoring father and mother, not murdering people, not stealing their stuff, not coveting them or what they have, or bearing false witness about them, not committing adultery and taking somebody else's wife or, or husband. And so uh, those two things, if you love God, you're not going to have other gods and use his name in vain and do these things. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to, as Paul says in Romans, you're not going to take their life, you're not going to take their wife, you're not going to covet their stuff, you're, not gonna, you're going to want for them, not from them. And so truly, love is that fulfillment. And so then, the reverse of that is, if we treat somebody partially, if we're going to look down on somebody because of their dress or social status or whatever, then that is the opposite of love. It's self-interest. You're thinking about what you get out of a situation rather than what you can be in that situation for that purpose. And so he says, look, it's contradictory with our faith to treat people partially. It's contradictory with our love. It's, it's contradictory with, with God and what God is like. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verses 7 and 8, it says, it was not because you were more in number. Now, this is God writing to his chosen people, Israel. He says, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. Remember when God first set his love on Israel? They weren't even a people yet. The man named Israel wasn't even born yet. It'd be a couple generations. He, God first set his affection on one man, Abraham, and his wife, Sarah. Actually, Abram and Sarai, their names weren't even changed yet. And they were a couple that could not have children. And so God's saying, I didn't choose you because you were the grandest nation. You weren't even a nation. You were an infertile couple. A couple that couldn't even have kids. And I chose you and told you I would bless you and make you great. And your descendants would be like the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. He says, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And so God is looking at the people that we call his, his chosen people. And he's saying, look, why did I choose you? It wasn't because you were all that in a bag of chips. It was just because I chose to love you. It wasn't because you were the greatest, because you were the smallest. And I chose you. You know, the New Testament tells us a very similar thing about ourselves. If you remember from back when we were working through the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, he says, For consider your calling, brothers. Now, your calling means God working in your heart, drawing you that point of salvation. It's exactly what uh, Daniel led us uh, through understanding more completely in our Sunday school this morning. He says, consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Boast in the Lord. He says, look, the same thing he did with Israel back then. He says, look, you're my chosen people. Why did I choose you? It wasn't because of your greatness. I just chose you because I loved you. And the New Testament, with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, he does the same thing. He says, look at around you. Are the cutting edge leaders of society in this crowd? But rather, God has chosen the weak things 
to triumph over the strong, the, the foolish things to triumph over the world's wisdom. To, he just chose us. And that's what James says. James lays out this story of this two people coming into the service. And he says in verse 5, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Which he has promised to those who love him? And so it's, it's, it's inconsistent with who God is. God is impartial. Ro Romans chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 says, There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil to the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good to the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. God is saying God is impartial. He shows no partiality. Therefore, we need to be impartial otherwise we're a contradiction of who god is in his nature psalm 72 4 says may he defend the cause of the poor and the, uh, of the people and the deliverance uh, give deliverance to the children of the needy and crush the oppressor uh, a few verses later he says for the delivers for he delivers the needy when he calls the poor and him who has no helper and so when we consider it here this morning, God says, look, it's his nature, his nature to not uh, be partial, to show no partiality. He treats the rich and the poor the same. In fact, he's saying, look, if, if you're going to slant it one way, you might say he favors the poor. Because God definitely has a soft spot for those who are downtrodden within the society, and he's going to watch out for them. And so, kind of lastly, in that, uh, in, in dealing with the principle, partiality is not consistent with our experience. He says, look at your, look at your experience as you look around us. Who, is, who, who would you say that God has chosen to make his children? Well, when you look broadly across the world and, and in probably every given situation, our pews are usually filled not with the people of power within society, but by common, ordinary people. Now, God, does God save the prominent? Yeah, absolutely. There's some. Many of the people in Old Testament and New, some of them were people of prominence. There is a, there's an added threat that comes with that prominence, or, or there's added temptations that come with those kinds of possessions. But, but there are some. You know, in, in, in Jerusalem, we office, often focus on the fact that, that in Jerusalem, in the early church, there were people that were so poor that other people were chipping in to help them. But the point is, there was both. There was a lot of poor people there dealing with struggles, but there were also people like Barnabas that had possessions and wealth that he could sell and, and chip in to help those people. As the gospel spread, there was other people like Lydia. Lydia, seller of purple, seemed to be doing very well listed as a prominent woman within her society. And so, yes, there's, there's people of both. There's people of wealth and there's people of poverty. The point is, we need to treat them all the same. But he says, if you look at a whole, at the big picture, what do you find? That typically the pews are full of people that you're going to have some powerful and prominent and wealthy here and there, but mostly it's just common, ordinary people. And some people that do struggle on the bottom end of it with poverty and things as well. And then he goes in to talk about, look at uh, what you experience in rubbing shoulders with the powerful. Isn't it usually the powerful that bring most of the persecution to the church? Yes. The people that aren't powerful don't have the ability to bring that kind of persecution to the church. But he's saying, look, isn't it, isn't it those people that are the, you find being the ones dragging you into court? Being in, you know, as, as we look at our religious liberties in our country and those things getting threatened uh, more and more as time goes on, you know who's going to be at the helm of those threats? It's going to be the powerful and the wealthy that are going to try to clamp down on religious liberties. Not the, po not the poor and the downtrodden. And so th that's what he says. He says, look, it doesn't make sense. Why would, you, why would you have it in your mindset that you need to honor the person that is wealthy and powerful and you can look down on the person that's not when that's the person that's going to trample you? It just doesn't make sense. And so pretty much any way we look at it, as we look through this passage, treating people with partiality doesn't make any sense. It does, it's not consistent with our faith. It's not consistent with the concept of love. It's not consistent with God and who he is. And it's not consistent with our own experience 
in this life. You know, I often think, don't you sometimes catch yourself, you see somebody that maybe is famous or has some abilities in some area, and you think, boy, if God, with the microphone that guy has, or that lady has, if God could save them, if God would save them, what, boy, how he could use them. You know what, God don't need them. That's, that's the whole point. We, we make distinctions, and that's what he says, aren't you evil, and you make distinctions. We constantly make distinctions and divide people up and the groups and things like that. And God says, don't really need to do any of that. Remember, that was one of the huge issues in the Corinthian church back when we studied that, that book. Was that they kept dividing up and making groups and then showing partiality to one and not so much to the other. Well, and then he gives us a test. What, 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 is, what is that test? As we consider the test... He says, oh, let's back up to verse 3. Actually, verse 2. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, as we learn in 1 Corinthians and other passages, there are times we're called to judge. And where the Bible tells us to judge those inside the church. And the church needs to make judgments. We need to hold one another accountable in that way. But these kinds of things where you show preferences over wealth and, and uh, clothing and things like that, they have n we have no business making judgments in those kinds of areas now notice what he says notice what he says in verse 3 if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing if you pay attention you know i found myself as i started to work through this passage and over and over and over again um i found myself saying all right well wait a minute what do i what do i pay attention to as I look at the relationships that I have with people and people that I talk to or spend time with, who, who gets my attention? Where does my attention go? Because that's, a, that's an indication of whether I'm somebody that deals partially or not. What, what do I favor? Because whatever I favor, that's, what, that's what's going to get my attention. Right? And so he says, well, if you pay attention to the one group and ignore the other one, then you're showing partiality. And so I can could kind of take my own relationships and start thinking, now, wait a minute, who do, I, who do I try to reach out to? Who do I try to have a conversation with? Who do I, where's my attention going? And then I think it helps us even deeper as he points out their response. He says, um, you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit, what's the next word? Here. What's he going to say to the other person? You stand over there. And you know, we all, we all do that, right? We all, you sit here. In other words, with one, with one person, you're pulling them close. You sit here. You, you come here. You, and with the other person, we're pushing away. You sit there. You go over there. And then it also makes another distinction because it says you sit here in a good seat, place of honor. You sit there or at my feet, not a place of honor. Right? And so, and so with one, you're trying to see the best for them. With the other one, I would say it's probably not a psych psychology tells you the opposite of love is not hate. It's just apathy. You don't, it's kind of not emotion at all. You just don't care. Right, and that seems to be kind of what this is. This one, I'm concerned that they have the best. This one, I don't really care so much. Just sit over there, sit down here, whatever. But just be quiet. Right. So you're, but that's the, but that's the point. So you can look. That gives us something to evaluate ourselves with, and say, well, wait a minute. Who do I, who do I pull close, and who do I keep at arm's length? What 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 makes what's the difference between those people? And you can kind of, you can start to evaluate your own heart, evaluate your own, what's ticking inside of you. As I said before, a lot of times these things are easier for somebody to see from the outside than for you to see 
in your own heart. Our, our heart's deceitful and def desperately wicked, the Bible tells us. Who can know it? And so to evaluate our own heart, he gives us these things. What are you paying attention to? Where does your attention go? Who do you pull close? Who do you hold off? And why? And you're able to, to kind of judge your own heart. And that, as the Bible tells us, if we judge ourselves, then we won't have to be judged because we'll take care of that problem. Well, then lastly is finally the outcome. And, and the outcome, I, I thought for a while, I thought, well, payment would be, uh, or punishment, or penalty. A penalty was what I kind of focused on for a while. And then at the last minute, I changed it. I said, you know, it's really not penalty because he doesn't actually insinuate that you're going to land in one spot or the other. He's wanting you to land in a good place. And he's trying to pull you toward that, but recognizes there's a pitfall of a wrong side of this issue. In verse 8, he says, If you really fulfill the royal law, according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. And so he's saying, look, as you look at yourself and who, what you pay attention to, who you pull close, who you push away, uh, if you evaluate yourself and you find that you are loving people um, well, then that's great. Then you're, you're doing well. Keep it up. But then he says, but if you show partiality, then you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now, where did we get the command to love your neighbor? From the law. And where do we get the conviction if we don't? From the law. And he says, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Remember at the beginning I said this seems to be kind of one of those sins that we kind of consider a white collar sin. In other words, not quite so bad. There really isn't a sin that's not quite so bad. But, um, and that's what he points out here. Is he says, look, if we, if we sin against God, then we sin against God. And that's all the, you know, we like to kind of stack them up. And I'm not saying that all sin is sin. Um, in that sense, there are definitely worse sins that you can find in, in the, the, the Bible expresses that way. In the Old Testament, some of them you died for, and some of them you were you know, paid a price for. But um, they weren't all even, but they were all bad. And that's what he's doing here is he says, look, if you, if you don't commit adultery but you murder, or vice versa, then you still broke the law. No matter which law you break, you broke the law. The law is like one body, one, one commentator that I read compared it to a window. He says you can smack a window with a hammer and you broke the whole window. You didn't just break the corner of the window, right? you broke the whole window. The window is broken. That's the way the law is. And the law is there to convict us. That's its job. You know, a lot of people have the idea throughout the world that the law is something that kind of stacks up pros and cons. And if you fulfill this law, then that's a, that's a mark in the plus side. And if you blow this law, you break this law, that's a minus in this column. And so in the end, you just total them all up. The Bible right here in the book of James says that is not how it works. If you've broken the law, it doesn't matter which one or how exactly you did it. If you broke the law, you broke the law. And you're guilty before God. Well, but wait a minute. I kept the law a thousand times and I only broke it five. You broke the law. You know, it's like I've, I've often said that nobody ever, I've never been pulled over by a police officer to thank me for going the speed limit. I've, I've never been pulled over on a one-way road to say, you know what, you're going the right way, keep it up. Now, I did get pulled over on one of those roads, you're going the wrong way. And it cost me a price because I'd had to go all the way around to get to the pizza place. It's so late at night, there's this one little quick road, just a half a block long. I pulled in there, and he was nice enough to let me go in and get my pizza while he wrote me a ticket. <laughs> but that's the point, that the job of the law is to convict. It's, it, shows our, it shows our guilt, and so that's what it does. It says, do not commit adultery. I also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who would be judged under the law of liberty. Under the law of liberty. And then he comes up with this little statement at the end about mercy. He says, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, I'm just going to make this simple because we're late. We need to kind of bring it to a close here. But what he's talking about in that is he's saying, look, if we treat people without mercy and we stand before God, we can expect 
no mercy. Now, wait a minute. He also talked about the law that gives liberty. How does this mercy triumphs over judgment? That police officer that wrote me a ticket could have had mercy. And mercy could have triumphed over judgment and I would have been paying for a pizza and not paying for a ticket. But he chose not to. Now, I don't blame him for not doing it because when he asked me, he said, you know, you not, weren't supposed to pull in that side. I said, I know, but my boss does it all the time. <laughs> and, and I did it in the middle of the night. There's no traffic around. If I, I didn't even see you, so I didn't buy much latitude that way. But the point is, he could have had mercy, but he didn't. I experienced judgment, and I should have right there. But what is he saying here with this whole thing with mercy's relationship to judgment? You know, when you receive the mercy of God in your life, it makes you merciful. Because you feel so thankful for the forgiveness that you've experienced that you become forgiving like that for other people. It's the same reason that Jesus would say, if you don't forgive anybody else for their trespasses against you, you're not going to be forgiven either. Well, wait a minute. Does that mean we get to heaven by forgiving others? No. You get to heaven by being forgiven by Christ. But when you are forgiven by Christ and you get a glimpse of how much you've been forgiven for Christ, you all of a sudden realize that it's a small thing for me to forgive them for these things. And so what happens is the Holy Spirit at work within you and the forgiveness that you experience from Christ makes you a forgiving person. And that's what he's saying here. I was going to read for you the story of Zacchaeus, but I'm going to abbreviate it because of our sake of time. Zacchaeus is somebody that wanted to see Jesus, and Jesus was coming to town, but Zacchaeus was short. So he climbs up in a tree so he can get a glimpse of Jesus. Jesus walks right up to Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to your house for lunch. And Zacchaeus is overwhelmed. He's just hoping for a glimpse of Jesus, and Jesus says, I'm going to your house. You're gonna, I'm your guest of honor today. And Zacchaeus comes down and a change takes place in Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus was a tax collector, which were known for cheating people. And he gets down and he says, you know what? I'm going to give a large percentage of everything I have away. And if I've defrauded anybody and can figure out who they were, I'm going to pay them back many times over what I took from them. Where did this come from? All he asked for was lunch. And this amazing change comes over Zacchaeus all of a sudden He's like recognizing how much he is being forgiven by Christ and makes him forgiving towards other people, makes him want to set everything right. You see what's happening? Mercy is triumphing over judgment. And so the outcome of this, the outcome of this needs to be that. He says, look, if we are looking down on people, looking at people partially, then we're committing sin. We are a transgressor. Those two words the word sin, hamartia, in the Greek, means to miss the mark. You fell short. The other one, a transgressor, means somebody that goes beyond God's limits. So in other words, we have both not gone far enough and gone too far at the same time. We've missed the mark in both ways. He says, if you're treating people like this, you have missed the mark. You've sinned. You're, you're a transgressor. You know what needs to happen here? Mercy needs to triumph over judgment. And when you, he's not really calling them to faith. He believes that they genuinely have faith. But he's saying that mercy that you've experienced in your life should make you merciful toward everybody else that's around you. Let mercy triumph over judgment. Do not show partiality toward one another. Our Father, we're thankful. We're thankful for your work within our hearts and lives. We're thankful, so thankful for the the great mercy that you've extended to us in providing forgiveness of sins through the blood of your son Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and resurrection from the dead. Father, we're so thankful for everything that you did for us. We recognize, Lord, that shy of that, there is absolutely no way for us to have acceptance with you. There's no way for us to have a home in heaven or eternal life because we've all broken the law in many different ways. And so, Father, we're thankful that you've looked upon us with kindness and favor. 
And we pray that you would then help us to look upon everyone else in the same way. It's in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and take our...